May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, Christ, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Every single time the collect for the day tells us to read, to mark, and to inwardly digest, I know what's coming. Because the collect is the prayer that sets our hearts and collects our thoughts in anticipation of the readings to come. And I often begin my sermon preparations by looking for the themes that the collect lifts up from the readings appointed for the day. So when all the collect gives me is read, mark, and inwardly digest, what I hear is good luck with that. And I laugh. I laugh because here we are. And this all feels so unbelievably impossible and awful. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Case rates are increasing. Deaths likewise increasing. We're all trying to figure out how to be thankful at Thanksgiving without killing anyone we love. Christmas is around the corner and we still don't have scientifically grounded federal guidelines on best practices for mitigating the spread of COVID-19? And these are the readings we get? Sort of like laughing at a funeral, not because you're not sad, but because it's all so much and your brain can't quite handle the scope of it all and you're really, really sad and you're really heartbroken. You, all you can do is laugh because it's so awful that is tilted from awful into absurd. So about those scriptures, it feels a little bit like the collect is saying to me today, read Mark and inwardly digest that sucker. You should have seen the discussions about these texts in clergy social media groups this week. The Van Gogh themed emoji of the scream came into play often. But behind the humor, there is real concern. Real concern that in the midst of our community's crises, yes, that is the plural, these texts will do more harm than good. Real concern that in the midst of our pain, that these passages might actually do damage to our souls real concern for how and where to find God's grace, even now, especially now. Because in all honesty, my presence here is predicated by the assumption that there is grace to be had, even now, especially now. You may remember, from sermons I've preached here in the past, how important it is for us to remember who we are and to whom we belong as beloved children of God. Not as some sort of feel-good, self-serving, self-help psychobabble, but as a means by which we can understand who we are within the context of God's creation. And so that we, knowing this, can withstand temptation and find the strength we need to face the challenges that confront us in this life. Knowing who we are as beloved children of God helps us to find our way in this world. And so in an effort to remind us all of who we are and to whom we become and to whom we belong. I want to offer some reminders from the very gospel we heard proclaimed today. Chapter five, blessed are the poor, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted and the reviled. Blessed are they. And then in chapter nine of the gospel, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, 
but sinners. And then chapter 10. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever given, gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. And then there are the words of comfort in chapter 11. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I shall give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. All this from the Gospel of Matthew. The same Gospel which offers us the parable we heard today. And against this backdrop, the Gospel seems incongruous. So what happened? Why was this particular parable included in the scriptures? Where did the community that originally heard this parable, parable proclaimed find grace in its proclamation? Grace in the midst of a passage that concludes with the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So to begin to unpack this parable, we need to take a look at the context in which it was written. Biblical scholar and theologian, John Dominic Curson in The Power of Parable, How Fiction by Jesus Became Fiction About Jesus, writes the, that the escalation of violence in Matthew stems from a conflict in Judaism between Christian Jewish scribes and Pharisaic Jewish scribes. And Kersan holds that Matthew crafts what Kersan calls these attack parables in response to this particular conflict. And that the authentic voice of Christ is twisted in Matthew's parable. Kersan validates his theory by cross-referencing the material in the Gospel of Matthew with that in the Gospel of Mark. Mark, which was the first Gospel to be composed, does not include the style of attack parable. And if the past two paragraphs just completely went like this, just know that we can describe this parable as a product of conflict and not of Christ. A product of conflict and not of Christ. It feels like we need to sit with that because it feels important that there might be things in scripture that are the product of conflict and not of Christ. And what does that mean? What does it mean if we understand that part of our inherited tradition is that of people who have used scripture as a means to their own ends instead of God's? What does it mean if we recognize in our sacred text that all too often it's our own desires being expressed instead of God's will? What if we turn a critical eye to what we think we know and instead listen to what the Spirit is trying to tell us? What if we were to stop assuming that every single angry man in scripture is somehow analogous to God. What if this parable isn't about the reign of God, but rather is about our assumptions about the reign of God? Assumptions based on our own understanding and perception of what human rule looks like. What if this scripture says more about us than it does about God? I know I am treading into tender places here. Many of us were raised and formed to accept scripture as the inherited word of God 
as infallible and unquestionable. And when we start to question what feel like inconsistencies or hypocrisies in the text, many of us tend to do one of two things, double down on scriptural infallibility or throw the whole thing out. But there is another way, the middle way of textual study, which challenges and questions the text. Challenges and questions not to prove our own point, our already decided upon and conclusive point, but challenges and questions in order to learn, grow, and discern where God's grace is being made manifest in the text and how we, how we are called to participate in the here and the now in the manifestation of that grace in the world. So knowing this, where is the grace in the passages we heard proclaimed today? Well, in seminary, we were encouraged to consider scripture from the perspective of the oppressed rather than the powerful. And so I consider the peasant class who would have heard Matthew's words. The, the peasant class would have seen in this description of the master, a description of systems where wealthy landowners benefited from the labor of the poor. They also would have seen in the first two men, a depiction of those who sold out to the proverbial man and who would participate willingly in the exploitation of their own people in order to preserve their own security. This parable to a peasant would have been a clear depiction of a human fiefdom in which a wealthy and capricious ruler accumulates wealth by sowing conflict and division within a context of punishment and fear. Does any of this resonate with your own reality? with our own reality in the here and the now? I hazard that the answer is yes, because human kingdoms, however they are defined, have a tendency to centralize wealth in the hands of the few. Those in positions of power have created and maintained laws and systems which all too often favor the few over the many. We have tax codes, which have advantaged the extremely wealthy. And we have systems and institutions that perpetuate poverty from generation to generation. We are all too familiar with government systems which allow those in positions of power to reap what they did not sow and gather what they did not winnow. We are also familiar with how tempting it can be to participate actively in our own exploitation when our participation gives us the benefit of the master's largesse. We are familiar with how fear is levied to divide us and distract us from our calling to do God's will in the world. So as I unpack this text, as I study and pray, it becomes clearer to me that this parable is not seeking to describe God or God's kingdom. It's describing us and the systems we have created and maintained. And in this, the threat is not some outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The threat is us. The threat is us, our greed, our fear, and our despair. This parable is a warning about our own kingdoms and an encouragement to find a better way, a way that serves the purpose of our loving God a way that is so carefully depicted in the Gospel of Matthew, which frames these parables, that that we heard last week and this week, 
between passages that both comfort us and send us to do God's work in the world. These passages read within the context of the entire gospel don't depict God's kingdom. They are set juxtaposed between what truly does. My burden is light. I bring comfort. Whoever gives even a cold cup of water, all of that. And then next week, when we continue in the Gospel of Matthew, the passages that follow this very passage will hear, come you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. What is shocking about these attack parables is that they exist juxtaposed with what can be and what we are called to do in this world. They are juxtaposed with reminders of who we are and to whom we belong as beloved children of God. And in that juxtaposition, they shock us into an awareness of how we've participated in systems that harm and hurt God's people. And that this is not God's will. And that we, as Christians, are called to something much, much more. So consider the possibility that this parable we heard today is describing what is, and that the words we hear next week are describing what might be. So read Mark and inwardly digest and remember God's mercy, compassion, love, encouragement, and forgiveness are ever present and ever there. And that is up to us to participate in the life-giving and salvific work of God in the world. It is up to us to participate. So read, mark, and inwardly digest so that we may embrace and hold fast to the blessed promise of everlasting life. Amen.